if you want to kill the population of leopards, just ignore conservation. Silent leopards are, um, <laughs> they are very unique. Because they're in constant conflict with Maasai and they are feeding off the Maasai livestock, they know humans very well. And when you get a big tom, he will generally outsmart you. We've seen a very big track of a leopard. I've seen this leopard before last year. He'll come eventually, I'm sure of it. Leopard is a solitary animal. It is the hunters who can give you information. You know, in this hunting block, there are 20 leopards. There are 10 leopards. That information is very critical. The hunting of the cats is very important in balancing the ecological nature. If you don't manage the population, then you create human war of conflict. But then you do hunting, managing it. Reduce that conflict. It's really up to the hunter's dollar to be able to trickle down to the community where they see a direct benefit from the hunter coming into the area. The revenue from the hunting is so critical to our conservation. Tanzania has actually got more land mass dedicated to wildlife than any other African country. With the national parks, non-conservative tourism, you are looking for a big number of tourists. Therefore, the carbon footprint is very high. When it comes to the sheer number of wildlife that Tanzania has to offer, we are unbeatable. So it's the choice you make to protect the entire system or to lose the entire system. My name is Lupo Santacilia. I am an Italian living in Tanzania since 1987, and I have been a professional hunter since 2006. So I was introduced to hunting through my father, and as the years went by, I moved up on the game that I started hunting. It started with, you know, the Impala, the Grants, then the Wildebeest, then the Eland, and finally at 14, it became the Buffalo. And so I had this very deep passion for hunting from a very young age. That was my introduction to hunting, and I always wanted to be a professional hunter. My name's uh, Damas Ndumbaro. I'm the member of parliament for Songea Urban Constituents and Minister of Natural Resources and Tourism of the United Republic of Tanzania. To be a minister, especially of the Minister of Natural Resources and Tourism, is one of the most challenging jobs in Tanzania. Because Tanzania is endowed with natural resources and tourist attractions. More than 54% of the country is conserved. Therefore, a minister of tourism, you are managing more than 54% of the country. This ministry contributes about 21% to the GDP. Therefore, you have to make sure that contribution does not go down. It's either maintained or goes up. Therefore, it's, it's, it's such a challenging job. You have to be on your toes at any time. My name is Edward Kohi. I am a principal research officer at Tanzania Wildlife Research Institute, but also I'm heading the unit called Conservation Information Monitoring Unit that do all the monitoring in the management of wildlife across the country. I used to go hunting with my uncles before I even graduated my high school, so it started connecting me with the nature. 
and I was interested again to see how do we keep seeing the animals. If you hunt today, if you don't manage them, then they are gone. Today you can't hunt tomorrow. And so then uh, we're looking how do we manage it and how do we make it sustainable over time. All my school were toward wildlife. Uh, my undergraduates I did at the Sokoina University of Agriculture where I did wildlife management. I did my PhD in elephant ecology. So most of my main training as a professional I did in wildlife. Beautiful first day of the hunt here. I heard a leopard last night around 4 a.m. Not so far from here, which is great. It's a good feeling. It's a really, really good feeling. No moon, getting less, and we are going to hunt our heart outs for the next 21 days. So let's have a good safari. So we're going to go towards the western side of the block. I've got a couple of bait sites I put up there. So we're going to go try, see if we can luck out on a zebra or a hard beast, maybe luck out on a buffalo, I don't know and try and put some baits on that side. And then, uh, yeah, come back this afternoon, see what fortune brings us. We are hunting in Masai East open area, which is a very diverse block. The eastern part of the block, we call it Lor Mojoy. Lor Mojoy is a range of hills that is in front of the camp we were staying in. And that's where you're gonna find your concentration of eland, fringe deodorix, coax hardebees. As you start heading northwest, we do have some plains where you do find decent numbers of grants. It's easier to hunt in Pala. Now, as you start going west, you go towards Nibramut Mountain, which is higher elevation with a big granite outcrop in it. And the bush around there is a lot thicker. Towards the east, you have a lot of old water holes that have been there for, for centuries. Now, unfortunately, due to the large quantity of livestock, they dry up a lot quicker than they used to. So you find the buffaloes, the big herds will move back to the park. But there are still these springs that you find around towards the hills, and that kind of keeps some of the buffalo in, some of the elephant in. Um, the leopard population is exceptional in our area. I think it's also because of these thickets that you find in the western part of it. It's very, very heavy bush, and a great diversity of wildlife. Oh, we've got some eland, oryx, zebra, nice mixed herd. We're gonna go real quiet. No, wait, he's down, he's down, he's down, he's down, he's down, he's down. He's down. Oh, thank you. Okay, look how worn out he is. Oh, wow. That's what you want to take. Older, older, older. Oh, look at the ivory. Look at the ivory on the bosses. Beautiful. It's a beautiful, old, old, old male. One of the things that we look for, and this is almost impossible to find out is this quote-unquote ivory. What it is is it's the inner portion of the horn, which is clear. This outer black protective layer, this is the coating that protects this soft inner layer. So for an animal like this to show these ivory traits in the front of the horns here where he's been fighting or using these to break branches and things like that, means he's very, very old. As, as Lupo was saying, he says, I've never even seen one. 
but this, this is, I mean, this is incredible. And, it, and it's what makes this really, really wonderful is that you've done everything you can to take the oldest animal possible out of an ecosystem. And, and that makes way for new genetics. This, I mean, everything here is food, top to bottom. We'll use a portion of the meat and then the rest will be for bait. And obviously all the fees go for managing this incredible area where you see a continued maintaining and growing of plains game and big cat populations. You know, if you don't maintain an area and take care of the entire ecosystem, then you lose, I think, a little bit of your soul. I'm very happy to be able to participate in this endeavor to continue to conserve our wild strongholds through hunting. We'll get this stuff sorted out. We'll go get some baits hung and good first morning, beautiful day. Temperature's perfect. Couldn't ask for any better. My first name is Remen, Ernest Muniz. I met Lupo 2010. I'm driver for this hunting car. In Arusha there also, I have my own car. I'm driving my car there as a tax driver. So that is my job. Now we are going to baiting. So we drive uh, ahead and then we are going to do the leopard bait. About a week and a half ago, I came up here and there was uh, some Maasai said they'd seen some lion climb go up. I think there's water on top of this mountain in these Korongos here. So we decided to come and look for a tree where we could put a bait for both uh, lion, leopard and hyena. So we're going to do that sort of lion height. We're going to put one a bit lower, which is sort of hyena height. We're going to do a drag up the hill just in case you know, there's a leopard there that catches our scent. Come down and hit it and then we're going to do a drag going east, who knows? Luck is always, let's, what is it? Luck favors the bold? <laughs> or I the balding? <laughs> yeah, I think the balding is how it is gonna look, <laughs> trust me. I really enjoy leopard hunting. I find my silent leopard to be very challenging. You always are looking for something that just inspires you. You're like, okay, if I was a cat, would I eat here? Yes. And the more you hunt them, the more you understand them, the more you understand how they behave. You also look for tracks, obviously. You know, you know that an air, a big cat's walked here. They'll go through that area now and they'll come back in two weeks' time. Last year, I baited this uh, place, but I'd put a hanging bait, which was a sort of, I was hoping for a lion because we'd seen a track around here. And this female leopard hit the bait, and obviously we had hyenas coming in uh, quite often. Every morning we'd find them here, spotted hyenas. And then um, we shot a very nice leopard, and later we realized that there was a female and a male. And the male was very long because I had, a, I had literally a lion bait and that leopard was, you know, standing on it rather comfortably. He wasn't hanging off it, so it means it was a very long leopard. Now, I think the tracks are the same. I think it's the same animal. We've just seen the tracks earlier and it's, you know, it's a very large pad, very, very deep pad. So that means he's heavy. And, um, yeah, let's see what, what this brings us. Hopefully something very nice.
really as a hunting destination, I still find that Tanzania remains a Shangri-La of hunting. There are so many huntable species. Most of the hunters are looking for cats and other species. There are so, so, so many. When it comes to the sheer number of wildlife that Tanzania has to offer, I am afraid to say that we are unbeatable. And the fact that we are able to access this, we are then allowed to also hunt this, is still extraordinary. The beauty about uh, Tanzania, conservation is done 100% by the government. There's no government in the world which is investing a lot of resources into conservation than Tanzania. Tanzania has actually got more land mass dedicated to wildlife than any other African country. Between its game reserves, its game control areas, its national park, it's a big chunk of land that is devoted to wildlife. 22 national parks. 27 game reserve, 22 game controlled area, 38 WMYs. All of these are managed by the government. That's why during the COVID, when tourism went down, the government had to chip in money to rescue conservation efforts. Therefore, in terms of conservation, the government is doing great. And this is thanks to Malimu's philosophy the late Malimu Nyerere, the father of the nation, is the one who was very enlightened on conservation. He set up these institutions immediately after independence, and they're still doing a good job. There's an institution under the ministry which is called Tanzania Wildlife Research Institute in acronyms as TAWILI. TAWILI is a collection of wildlife scientists whose full-time responsibility is to take care of wildlife. TAWILI is doing wildlife sensors every year using small plane connected with automatic cameras which counts those animals automatically. The sensors can detect the type of animal and the number. We have a system that set quarters. We have the monitoring data where we are doing survey on the ecosystem rather than on a concession. And then we are looking what is the trend of that animal? Is it stable, increasing or declining? If the trend of that species is on the declining, normally we take the two decision to stop the quarter or to cut by a half. So that helps us uh, to manage uh, the quota setting, but also we want to see the turn of the hunting companies. I gave you two buffalo. You only manage to hunt one buffalo. So that's with my trend, tell me you couldn't get old enough buffalo to hunt, so we cut it. If that trend goes declining, we stop the quota. So that helps us uh, to manage uh, the quota setting. Hunting quotas are strictly managed hunting licenses, which are issued by the government in order to regulate the annual hunting harvest. The Tanzanian government sets the quota yearly based on the research conducted by biologists. When an animal is harvested, the professional hunter must prepare documents which are then submitted to the government. These documents detail all the information in regard to the harvest to include the species and gender, coordinate location, type and caliber of the weapon used, horn measurements, and body weight. All this information is recorded and used for scientific purposes to set the quota for the following year.
Look at that ivory. Look at that. He is gorgeous. Look at that. He's completely ivory. He's lost at least an inch or two. This guy was, when he was younger, he was up here. Yeah. Look at that. He was here. He had at least an inch and a half more. He's no herd, all by himself. He's the right animal to take. Perfect bait animal. Now he becomes part of the circle of life. He drove up, he was eating. Oh my goodness. Na funga apa la kim? Ene kadia kilaini na tumem shtua. We push them off. The silent leopard are, um, <laughs> they are very unique, very smart, especially the old toms. Your average Maasai lion tom is a big tom. Because they're in constant conflict with Maasai and they are feeding off the Maasai livestock, they know humans very well. And when you get a big tom, he will generally outsmart you. Look at that dewlap. Big, big dewlap. That's a big cat. You need to outsmart him, and every time you succeed or fail in hunting one of them, you learn something new on how to hunt the next one. You prep the blind before you even put the bait up. Because in Maasai land, when a leopard sees anything different, once he started feeding, generally, especially if he's an old tom, he'll go. So you prep your bait, you prep your sight, you clear your shooting lane, you get it ready so that when he hits, you even put up the front of the blind up. So that when he hits, all you have to do is either put a pop-up or just finish the sight and sit. When a bait hits, you generally have three days to play with that guy. Three to four days. Then he's gonna move on. We came here uh, yesterday. We found a very nice leopard track. So we thought on the way home, after having checked the two leopard uh, baits that have been hit, to put a bait here, hoping that it will drag in that nice leopard. And let's see what happens. Hopefully we'll get lucky with this too. Largest of the hyena family, these spotted hyenas are the first to catch the scent of the fresh bait site in the hope of an easy meal. Later that night, this mature male leopard which the team was hoping to catch a glimpse of, also catches the scent and begins feeding on the bait. At many other bait sites around the concession, various leopards of different ages also feed throughout the night. The Maasai as a whole came into Tanzania in the sort of 1800s. It's a nomadic tribe. You know. Livestock is their money. It's their monetary value. It's all based on livestock. Uh, their dowry is based on livestock. They trade on livestock. Just you know, in the Arusha region in Tanzania, the livestock trade that the Maasai have is probably close to $40 million a year. You know, for a Maasai, you know, the more cows you have, the richer you are. It's really not about quality, it's really about quantity which is detrimental for the bush animals. For them in their culture, like all the cows in the world belong to them. That's, that's all theirs. You know, they're, they're an old culture. Uh, they have 
pretty much stuck to their ways and you know, I can, you kind of respect them for that. They've decided this is the way we are, that's how we're going to be. You see, the Maasai's have always had a very good relationship with the wildlife in the sense that they don't really poach it. Apart from obviously, you know, predators, they, they don't have a very good relationship with it. They've always been like that, you know, they used to hunt lions for obvious reasons. Now obviously they can't anymore, but they still kind of do at times because, you know, they're pastoralists. We are working together with this Maasai. We go around and sometimes we meet the Maasai, we ask them where they saw the leopard, where they saw the lion, because this lion and the leopard is their vermin animal to their cattle, sheep, goat and their cow. It is eaten by, by lion. So few Maasai, they give us full support and they are happy once we be hunting the oldest leopard they are most able to catch uh, their livestock. Cats have been hitting our baits. We've got a couple on bait. This is one of them here. A cat was feeding here this morning. And this is the cat that fell out of the tree. <laughs> you can see where the scratches are up there where he was just... Ah! Yeah, it was quite hilarious watching the cat fall out and then to see the claw marks from like its back, you know, rear legs and front and holding on. And you can see the claw marks on the actual front, tree yeah. trunk. So you can see that he's got a big paw. He's a, he's a nice kitty. He really is a nice kitty. Only issue now that I have is that the wind has changed. I say the, the weather has been quite kooky for the last couple of days. Let's hope that it just goes back to normal. He's got everything you need. He's got age. He's got mass, size, um, skin, big dewlap. He, he's definitely a, a good animal to harvest. What you have in Tanzania is you have national parks, which is just for photographic safaris. Then you have game reserves, which were set up where only hunting can be conducted. No human settlement or livestock in it. It's purely just for hunting. Then you have game controlled areas. Game controlled areas were set up years ago, which are areas where livestock can exist and settlements, but no farming. And then what you have is open areas. Now, open areas, it's a free-for-all, meaning you can have wildlife, you can have livestock, you can have farms, you can have towns. And, and they have worked in the past, you know, but obviously now with the population growing and the livestock growing, the wildlife is suffering from it. Tanzania is a very large country and it's got some incredibly good arable soil. The population of Tanzania at the moment I think is 59 million. It is I think the third fastest growing population in the world. And from a agricultural standpoint and landmass standpoint, it can easily hold it. But a lot of the population are in rural areas, they're in constant conflict with this wildlife, whether it's for land, whether it's for grazing, whether it's just for survival. And this human wildlife conflict in these rural areas has created a massive decrease in wildlife in certain parts of Tanzania. So the biggest problem we do have is that people need land, people need to eat, wildlife is cheaper than beef or goat or lamb or whatever it is that they eat. It is preferred, so obviously poaching is also a very big problem. The poacher is an illegal hunter because you're not authorized, so we don't know how much you're going to take what size, what species. Sometimes you take even unauthorized species like giraffe. So that's why it's the difference between poachers and hunter, because the hunter has to be authorized with a license. That's a big cloma. Probably 
spooked him. Anyway. Nope, there he is. He is? Yes. Let me see. Oh, yeah. He's Who here. You up? That's a big kitty, man. Let me just check the height. See that line? Yeah. At the shoulder. He doesn't have a massive head. You think maybe he's still young with that smaller head? So I just want to see a bit more footage. Leopards, their heads never stop growing. So the bigger the head, the older the animal. That's one of the ways you judge age. By what I see, by the size of his testicles, it looks to me like he's a younger cat. I mean, he's a big cat, but his head's small. He doesn't have a thick neck. I'm not gonna sit on this cat yet. The introduction of trail cams has helped us massively. First of all, to get an actual portfolio of the cats that you have in the area. You start understanding the quantity of cats you have, who they are, their age, you can age them. You know, in this particular area, there's this cat, he's still too young, but we're gonna bait him so that every year we can see him. And the fact that we have trail cams to follow that helps us, helps us know this area has this cat, this area have these cats, this area has these cats. And you might have a cat that's young and suddenly, boom, a bigger old male comes in. You know it's a good tree, you know it's a good place. You know a cat's gonna come in eventually. That's what a trail cam helps you do. We had three other big leopards. Then we got a fourth leopard that came and went. We changed a couple of baits around to try and get the leopards back on because we'd lost them, so we kind of moved it around, they came back. And we've got these baiting cars that are helping us bait whilst we're trying to hunt and check baits too because now we've got an area that is massive. It's 2,500 square kilometers and we've got these baits that are spread out throughout the whole place. So we shut some baits off and focused on other baits. We know there's these big cats around. We know there's these big toms. Now we're trying to decide where do we sit or we discover that some were feeding at night. How do we get them to feed during the day? What do we do? Do we drop the baits down or one of the baits down? You, you try and play all the tricks you have. Very incredible area. I mean, there's more leopards here than anywhere I've ever been. Definitely what I would consider a stronghold for leopards, and hopefully they could turn into a game reserve here one day. And that would mean is that the cows and all the rest of that would be moved off it from a permanent standpoint and, and turn into a, you know, specifically for animals. You see a real change in the environment here. As it stands right now, the animal populations here seem to be stable at the moment. There's plenty of grays, plenty of feet, so that's good. But it can always be better. And the great news is, is there's potential for that here. The leopards are not only big, but in very high quantity. And we've seen females with multiple cubs, which speaks to the amount of game that's available for feeding two cubs and we've seen plenty of sub-adults and young males and then we've seen a couple of big big old males more than a couple we've seen actually about six that's really good news for us i mean the great part about hunting leopards honestly is sitting in a blind and being quiet and people go well that sounds really boring it's not if you're paying attention and switched on it's a moment in which you can really enjoy everything that's going on around you and listen to it in a completely different way you're listening to the calls of the birds as they wake up in the morning or go to sleep at night and 
you're listening for alarm calls and you're listening to the sounds of the bush that tell you hey there's a leopard in the area and by doing so you you hear so much more than you would if you were just walking through the bush and you see all kinds of stuff not, not just bird life but you know, mammal life as well I mean you see elephants and buffalo and you know everything else it's just sitting quietly in one place and really paying attention is is actually quite enjoyable and then you know the hunting itself is difficult uh, you get multiple leopard on bait but they're feeding at night because there's too many cows around uh, you get a leopard on bait in a quiet area but he's only coming first thing in the morning or he comes in eats everything and leaves and doesn't come back for four days and it is a constant game of chess it's an exciting one and and irregardless of the outcome we will have had a, a successful hunt in the sense that we've hunted well we've hunted hard and we've hunted correctly so if we can figure out a way to to get a leopard that'll be great but the hunt for the leopard has been really great so far and the chess match is is, is definitely in full swing We had at least four females that had two cubs. What impressed me was the fact that every single female that had cubs had two cubs, not one. And they weren't small cubs, they were actually juvenile cubs, meaning that they were already in the size where they can take care of themselves. And that impressed me. So the survival rate in the area is very high compared to other parts of the country. You might have a female with cubs, but you are still gonna feed that because you will find that maybe a male would come by because there is a female making noise. So you want that bait to keep on going. Suddenly we had these baits and we had these big cats and we knew there was one big cat here and we have a new cat there. So we decided, should we sit on this one? Then the daylight leopard comes back on. So we're like, okay, let's go for him. And whilst all this is happening, this forgotten in the middle of nowhere bait that I'd put in between this mountain, this really thick area, we can get a radio call, boss, it's been hit hard. And when we see the footage, the whole safari changes. Broad daylight this morning. Today, and today he was here just now. Yep, right there. He was here just now. Yep, all right. He's just here. This guy's not far. Look where he slept. See there? there. He is huge. Look at him. No, I need to see this evening. This evening. What time did he come in this evening? There. 621. He's gonna be here at six. It's perfect. We're sitting, we're sitting. There's no questions here, guys.
information from the hunting is also very critical. Leopard is a solitary animal. It doesn't want to be exposed, always hiding. It is the hunters who can give you information. Now in this hunting block, there are 20 leopards. There are 10 leopards. We have seen three leopards. That information also is very critical. It's put into our data and we use it for management purposes, including allocation for the quotas for the next year. The system is well designed, well elaborated, well coordinated and well supervised. There's always the exhilaration and the frustration. You think this is a great bait site and it doesn't get hit. You know, cats are opportunistic. It's a free meal. They're going to stay there as long as they can. Once they get bored, they're gone. Or something disturbs them, they're gone. There's so much food out there. They can hunt easily. But no, as cats, they're opportunistic. <laughs> Look at that. A restaurant and they go and eat at it.
The way we organize in this country, in most cases, we find hunting concessions are adjacent to national parks. So the national parks become a core area. So the hunting also regulates the population boom within the parks and other areas. With the national parks, non-conservative tourism, you are looking for a big number of tourists, not necessarily the highest any. You do have very high-end photographic lodges that charge close enough to what a hunting company will charge for a safari, but the average person will pay, you know, whatever, $250, $300 a day. They come into national parks, all organized, lots of wildlife, really beautiful lodge with all the amenities that are needed. Now, a hunting tourist spends a lot more than that and is generally hunting in an extremely remote area where, as beautiful as it is, you've got tsetse flies, you've got ants, you've got snakes, and you're walking everywhere. And, you know, the concentration of the game is not Serengeti National Park, it's not Ngorongoro. Generally, the hunter is willing to pay a lot more to access these areas and endure the difficulty of bad roads and tsetse flies and mosquitoes and the heat to be able to pursue this passion of his. If you take a photographic client and you put him in there, it's not going to go very well. Right now, photographic tourism is still earning more than hunting tourism. At our best, we managed to do 1.5 million tourists. Now, take an average, at least four tourists use one car. How many cars are visiting the national parks? What about the service providers? the flight going flying to Solonera and the other airstrips within the national parks. Therefore, the carbon footprint is very high on non-consumptive tourism than consumptive tourism.
So today we're on day three, tangoing with this very large leopard. We've kind of figured out his habits, so we're going to try play a trick. Uh, we're going to come in with a car. I'm going to leave the car until about six in the morning. So that allows him not to come in at 5.30, which is when he's coming in, leaving at six. And hopefully, he'll keep him away. Yeah, it's going to be incredible. Otherwise, we have other plans after that, but we'll discuss that once we're done with this plan. You know, keep the tension going. <laughs> As another morning comes to an end, the team has yet to see the mature leopard during daylight. Once again, only the striped hyena finds interest in the bait. The time has come for the team to hunt more game to freshen the bait site. been hunting zebra this morning and and we weren't sure which one the male was and we thought the one in the back was the, the, of the two was bigger we thought he was the that was the stallion and then it turns out we're looking and we're looking and the one in the front is injured and it's kind of small and very scrawny and we thought well it's a male as we came up to him we found out not only was he injured and needed to be put down turns out he's quite quite old I mean, he's so old that he didn't have much left in him so we're very very pleased and very happy about taking such an old animal You try and play all the tricks you have. You've got all these cards. You're playing a poker game with this guy. 
So you're trying to trick him, you're trying to find a way for him to have difficulty in feeding, to keep him on bait, to keep him away from the bait until daylight comes in, to make him from a night feeder to a day feeder. Every leopard is different. Every leopard is different. So we were driving back from sitting on a leopard blind and we found this dead calf that had just been killed by hyenas by the tracks of it and they were dragging it out and they heard the car and uh, ran off. So the moment we drive off, this thing's going to be devoured. So yeah, so this is one of the human wildlife conflicts and unfortunately what tends to happen when something like this happens with a lion or anything else. Sometimes the Maasai, what they'll do is they'll throw a dip on it. Then when the predators come back, it kills them and everything else that eats it. So it's unfortunate. It's against the law and if they get caught doing that, they get heavily, heavily fined. But yeah, there it is, human wildlife gone. The animals need a place to live and so do the people. And finding that balance is not easy. It's a very difficult, and multifaceted problem and it's going to require some multifaceted solutions there needs to be room for everybody so hunting is one of the ways to create that we lose more cats on livestock conflict rather than on hunting sometimes it's better managed in these areas by putting hunting concessions so you can take all these old cats that create conflicts and then get killed by poison or by spears in these areas and then you get money to back to conservation you generate revenue that help again conservation so it's the choice you make to generate revenue to protect the entire system or to lose the entire system that's why tanzania is still the country across the global have more than 50 percent of the lion population more than 50 percent of the lions across the global still in tanzania why and we still have hunting because you manage these areas by using a hunting as a tools so we have that system check and balance so today we actually hit the skinning shed we decided we're going to just i've sent two guys on the left side of this hill we're going to go down on the right ridge and just look down and see if we can spot some lesser kudu or whatever else uh, we're blessed with so hopefully by lunchtime, we'll be back with something, or at least a lot of thorns. Mm, exactly. <laughs> we're, in, we're in no particular hurry this morning. This is... Uh, a leisurely time. Yeah, we, we've been... Working hard. Yeah, I'm a bit exhausted at this point.
So here we are on top of this um, mountain. Uh, we're sitting here looking at, uh, see if we can luck out on some lesser kudu. What we've noticed is there's quite a few cows coming in from one of the bombers down here. They come to feed. I mean, we still have a lot of grass. What we don't have now, though, is water. The water's drying up very, very quickly. What we're seeing, especially in the western part of the block, is those big water ponds are drying up. So all the um, cattle is now moving further northwest uh, towards the Simanjiro Plains, where there is more permanent water. So they'll take their cows up there to water them, and there's, there's still quite a bit of grass around. In a way that is um, favorable for us because obviously once the cows move out you have um, less pressure on, on the area. But unfortunately the lack of water lessens the, the possibility on, on the buffalo in the sense the buffalo also move out because they also need water every second day and stuff. So this area is very thick and obviously you know with the rains the grass is taller, the bushes are a lot more alive. As it dries up a lot of them lose their leaves, the grass falls flat and it's a lot easier to see so you know you you end up seeing a lot more game like lesser kudu but all the stuff that lives in the thickets are now easier to be seen as the year continues and it continues drying up we'll see more and more game It's kind of nice. We've been go, go, go for about the last week. Everybody's pretty exhausted. A consensus was made between Lupo and himself that maybe we ought to take a, a moment, which I wholeheartedly agree in. We decided to climb a mountain, look for lesser kudu, and just kind of not wake up at 2.30 in the morning for once, which was nice. And we're getting here close to the end of this incredible trip. But it's just nice to kind of take a moment and be where you are. Plan now, go have a quick lunch, head off to the next location, keep hunting. There's a valiant effort and a very fine view. Couldn't ask for a prettier view. Wonderful way to spend the morning. Our pursuit is we start at 1, 2 in the morning, drive all the way to that bay, sit the morning, fail, go hunting, go back in the evening, fail. While the baiting car is following us so that if we shoot a zebra, he can take the meat, skin it, quarter it, we now have meat to bait again. And we're trying all these different tricks. And we realize that we have changed the habit of this cat. They know we're there. So now we need to outwit them. So after three days of not sleeping and hunting all day and going off like maniacs, we say, okay, let's build a machine. Shawn is a blind you put on top of a tree. And what that does is it gives you a different angle. Generally, your scent will be a lot higher than where the animal's coming from. It'll always look at the ground. It allows you a bit more secrecy, if well built.
in this particular case, we're in a very thick area. But if you put them high, you can actually see animals coming in from afar. It gives you more time to prepare yourself. By the time the animal gets there, you're kind of prepared already. As the 21-day hunting license nears expiration, the hunting team purchases a two-day extension with the hopes that the extra time will provide them with an opportunity to finally find this old leopard during daylight. Well, we have an early start today. Nice overcast evening. Today's gonna to be a hell of a good day. The thing about leopard hunting is that it can take three, four days, it can take 23 days, 28 days to get a big cat. Now, when you have a baiting car and you have trail cams, it makes it a lot easier. But it's very time consuming. It's frustrating because you'll have a cat on and then it feeds at night. Now you need to move it to the day. Now you have another cat over there. Now you're trying to make a decision. You shit, he doesn't come in. You've made a mistake. It's made a mistake. Maybe it's caught something. Maybe it's you. You don't know if it's the bait. Maybe it's because the ants have come. And once you start putting those uh, factors together, it becomes a rather stressful situation. Also because you're still trying to collect certain species. You're now neglecting your buffalo. You might be neglecting other animals that you really want, like a lesser kudu or a garnock or whatever it is. 
and you're so focused on that animal that you just say, okay, that's it. That, that is what we want, that's the pinnacle, and that's what we're going to do. And if we, in between, if we manage to shoot something, great. But you still need to put bait. So you need to find a zebra, that extra last zebra that you have, or that extra last impala that you have, or that grass gazelle you have, because you want to feed it. You want to have fresh bait with the old bait. So it's, it's literally a cat and mouse game. So it can be extremely frustrating, especially if at the end of it all, you don't succeed. Due to the challenges that the hunting team is facing, they develop a new strategy to coax the leopard to feed during daylight. The Land Cruiser's diesel engine appears to be spooking the leopard, and they will now walk the one kilometer to the bait site, then spend the night in the mush on. The hunting team splits, and the supporting element sets up a small camp a few kilometers away from the bait site. The entire team is spending the night in the bush. Success or failure is shared equally by each member of the team. As sunlight fades to darkness, the leopard has eluded the hunters once more. The overnight in the bush has begun. The team has already spent over eight hours in the Mashan in nearly total silence. Now they must continue through the night. We decide to sleep the night in the blind. And sure enough, there he comes. 10 o'clock. We can hear him crunching away and feeds all the way to 
last day, last evening, we drop the rotting meat at the base of the tree. We sit there, we wait. can just see him trying to take the bait behind the tree trunk as he's looking at the ground bait thinking we're in there. They're dead behind the tree. Sure. He's dead? Uh, yeah, I can see him. Like... Yeah. yeah. I can see him dead behind the tree. He never moved. He's there dead. Lupo! Just give me a second, man. Give me a second. <laughs> so much emotion in my life. Lupo! 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 Amy, Amy, Amy. Yo. Kabubi. Roja nakuja. Kabubi. Kabubi, Kabubi. Kabubi! The last hour of the last day. What time is it? 6.30. Guys. 6.30, exactly. We did it. Yes. We Look at that. It. He was dead Dustin, at 6.28. 6.28 thank dead. Thank you, Dustin. We are so happy, man. <laughs> My prayer. Kabubi, 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 kabubi. Six days. Six days. Six days and two minutes before the end of, of legal, legal shooting, shooting hour. hours. They teach you how to hunt. We even extended our safaris in the hope that we could get this, you know, and, and I was very fortunate that I had a, a client like Ed that was like, look, it doesn't matter if I get it or I don't, we hunted him. And we were fortunate enough that two minutes before the end of legal shooting line, we took it. I have never suffered so much <laughs> on a hunt in my life. I don't know if you can see the Go happiness on. in my face, but it's like... This leopard hunt was probably the hardest leopard hunt I've ever done. And the animal we collected is probably the most beautiful leopard I've ever taken. Obviously there was an aspect of exhilaration to the harvest of this animal because of its difficulty, how smart he was. You know, they say you hunt lion with your heart, you hunt leopard with your mind. This leopard, uh, for me, is probably one of the pinnacles of my career as a professional hunter just because of the difficulty. We caught the most amazing leopard ever. We worked incredibly hard. It was a team effort. Everybody put many hours into it. And we got it. And at the same time, we all felt that, you know, this incredible animal was now gone. And I, I think that's pretty normal for somebody that does what, love wildlife and love, loves doing what we do, which is also protecting wildlife. We've 
taken an incredible creature. I mean, look at even the rosettes of this guy. I mean, it looks oh. like a jaguar, to be honest. He's oh, just yeah. so beautiful, and he's massive, and he's got a huge neck, he's got a huge head. As my friend Lauren said, Lupo, you can do 50 safaris in Africa and never see a leopard this size. And I think the proof is right here. I mean, this leopard is absolutely magnificent. In the three weeks spending time in the bush here and, and really documenting a lot of the, the leopard population in this area, how healthy it is and how viable it is. And, and that's a, not only is that a really great thing from a conservation standpoint, but then you look at it and you go, okay, let's take one or two or three leopards out of this block per year, use that money, fund more anti-poaching, you know, keep the leopard population healthy and growing and, and all the rest of the plains game and the buffalo and everything else, the elephants, everything benefits from that. The financial aspects of having harvested this leopard will now give us the funds that we can utilize for anti-poaching, community development, and the important things that allow us to keep this area protected and safe for wildlife to coexist in it. I want to tell the people who I think maybe hunting is not good. Hunting is good because I'm the witness. I'm the one um, benefiting from this hunting. I have a family, I have a wife and two daughters. They are going to school. I have my mother who depends on me. Also, there are the money coming to the community and the community benefit to that hunting. Getting school, roads, hospital, and uh, help from this company. They have sick people, they need water. So I run my life due to this hunting. Um, depending on this. The hunter is willing to spend the money and go the extra mile to go into these wilderness areas in pursuit of his passion. It is up to the companies, and that's why I stress out companies are crucial for this conservation effort. It is up to the companies to then reinvest the money that is made out of hunting also into the communities to make sure that the communities benefit from the wildlife. There's a very simple saying, if it pays, it stays. That's about as simple as I can put it. If the wildlife has value to a community, they will protect it. If the animal no longer has value and is a burden, they will eat it. And that's throughout the world, it's not just here. Professional hunting that follows all the regulations doesn't affect the population of the wild animals, doesn't affect. Anything goes irregular. That's what we could see, like elephant poaching created that population collapse. But not trophy hunting of elephant, no. Hunting itself, it's a tool of management. It's helped to maintain the population, take out the old, give the chance for the young bulls and uh, things to pass by the genes. And that maintaining different populations across our ecosystems that have been structured. And that why we have a national park surrounded by hunting, manage that population. If you don't manage, it's then you create human world of conflict. But then you do hunting, managing it. Reduce that conflict. Thank you, sir. 20, 20, This hat was a different color when I bought it. And as we all know, big African cats, they really don't eat tenderloin. So you have to take it out. If they see the tenderloin, they won't hit the bait. So you take the tenderloin out and bring it to the kitchen, which is always good. And then the rest is bait. And... Cows. I told you it was cows. <laughs> I saw it behind the tree. 
<laughs> we just looked at some cows. <laughs> Daga <Dug> boy. <laughs> Red Daga boy. I didn't see that one. I saw the ones behind the bush. Yeah.